Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Kenwood Heights Christian Church. My name is Randy, and I serve on staff as a senior minister with our church. I want to welcome you here today and tell you that we are so glad that you are here with us. We're thankful for another opportunity to come together and worship our Lord. We've got a great day planned for you. And here in just a few moments, I'm going to pass this off to Peyton Baskins, who's going to lead our worship again this Sunday. And then Alex is going to come and bring us a message from God's Word. As we get started today, I want to give you a couple of reminders about some things that we are doing. And then I pray for us and we'll continue on in our service together this day. I want to remind you as we do every week that we are here at the church building until 1 o'clock today for drive through communion, offering drop-off, and prayer as requested. Feel free to come on by and join us if you'd like. We'd love to have you. I want to encourage you today as well to check out our website, KenwoodHeights.com. Just click on our online church page, and there you will see some of the resources that we have available for you and for all ages. Next week, I'm excited to say that we'll be releasing our reopening plans for in-person worship. Please be watching for information about that. Please share this video with friends and family on Facebook or YouTube, whatever platforms that you use to connect with us online. We want to have as many people join us as we can. Please let us know how we can pray for you, how we can encourage you, and how we can help support you during this time. My last reminder for you is one that we announced two weeks ago on Mother's Day. Last year, we became a ministry partner with ALC, short for A Loving Choice. And from Mother's Day to Father's Day, we are helping them collect donations in a virtual baby bottle campaign to help moms and their babies come to know the love of Jesus. Some of you remember years ago when we took baby bottles home and filled them with our donations and brought them back to the church building. Due to concerns associated with COVID-19, we are doing a virtual baby bottle campaign this year. Here's how you can donate if you would like. You can donate online today at alckentucky.com slash support dash us. That's alckentucky.com slash support dash us. You can also text the amount you want to donate to 502-443-1288. That's 502-443-1288. Eight, eight. Or you can mail your donation to P.O. Box 1575, Shelbyville, Kentucky, 40066. Again, that's P.O. Box 1575, Shelbyville, Kentucky, 40066. We are excited to be ministry partners with ALC as together we help moms and their children come to know the love of Jesus as we provide help to them. We are so glad that you have joined us today for worship. Let me pray for us, and then we'll continue on in our worship today. Father, we want to thank you for this opportunity to gather, even online, to worship together as your children and as family. We thank you so much for the love of Jesus and his sacrifice that binds us all together. We are all recipients of your grace, and we gather together to express our love and devotion to you. And we thank you for the opportunity. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's lift up praise to the King of Kings this morning. darkness we were waiting without hope without light 
Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. To reveal the kingdom coming And to reconcile the lost To redeem the whole creation You did not despise the cross For even in your suffering You saw to the other side Knowing this was our salvation Jesus for our sake you died Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. morning that you rose all of heaven held its breath till that stone was moved for good for the lamb had conquered death and the dead rose from their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who'd come to the father are restored and the church of christ was born and the spirit lit the flame now this gospel truth of old it shall not kneel it shall not faint by his blood and in his name in his freedom i am free for the love of jesus christ who has resurrected me Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings, praise forever to the King of kings. You were the word at the beginning, one with God the Lord most high. You hid in glory What a beautiful name it is, what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this, what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus didn't want heaven without us so jesus you brought heaven down my sin
Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Kenwood Heights Christian Church this morning. And to all of you who are joining us today, we are so thankful to have you with us. Uh, My name is Alex, and I serve as youth minister on staff at our church. And today, uh, I want to welcome you to week 10 of our online church. Uh, Week 10, hard to believe. Um, And just real quick, before we get going this morning, uh, just let me say to all of you who have come alongside of us, whether for all 10 weeks, or even if this is your very first Sunday joining us, uh, we just want to share with you again how happy we are to have you be a part of our online church family. Uh, We are so thankful to have you faithfully join alongside of us for worship during these last 10 weeks, and I know I speak for many people when I say that you as a church family have been so incredibly encouraging to us as a staff and as a leadership during this time. Uh, It's been so great to watch as our church has rallied together. Uh, We have been so incredible in collecting donations for different missions that we have been taking a part in uh, over these last several weeks, and even now uh, with our partnership with ALC. And you as a church family, you have done an incredible job each week in in sharing our videos with your friends and your family uh, as we try to connect with as many people as we possibly can. Uh, And it has truly been such a joy for us to come together each and every single week for worship. Uh, Bridget Willard once said these words. She said, church isn't where you meet. Church isn't a building. Church is what you do. Church is who you are. Church is the human outworking of the person of Jesus Christ. Let's not go to church. Let's be the church. And church, Kenwood Heights Christian Church, can I tell you something? You are doing an incredible job of this. And it has been such a joy to see how God's church has been so active over these last 10 weeks. Obviously, things have have looked a little bit different. But most importantly, we have had the opportunity to worship together. And whether that's in person, online, or anywhere we go, isn't it so good for us to worship our God together? You know, I've always loved what Psalm 84 verse 10 says. It says, a single day in your courts is better than a thousand anywhere else. I would rather be a gatekeeper in the house of my God than live the good life in the homes of the wicked. And isn't that so true? Isn't it so true that a single day in the presence of our creator God far outweighs any of the other days anywhere else? Thousands of days anywhere else. One singular day in the presence of our creator God is greater. What a joy it is that we have when we come into the presence of Almighty God, when we give our hearts to Him daily and we say, God, you lead. God, you take control of my thoughts. God, you take control of my actions, my words. Father, my family and my loved ones and those around me, may they not simply just see me, but may they rather see you through me. Paul writes these words in Galatians chapter 2. He says, My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And as a Christian, as a follower of Christ Jesus, that is our ultimate prayer. 
that we, we may live in such a way that our God is seen as greater than ourselves. The book of John gives us such a a powerful model to look at when it comes to having a relationship with Jesus Christ. John chapter 3 verse 30 says these simple and yet powerful words about what it means to, to live a life for Jesus Christ when it says that he must become greater and greater and I must become less and less. But I love the way that the New American Standard Bible translates John 3.30 when it simply says this. It says, he must increase, but I must decrease. He must be first. He must go before me. The world must see him before it sees me because without him, there is no me. And when I know him and when I come to know him more, I want others to know him as well. Because when I did not know him, when I was apart from him, when Jesus came into my life, Jesus changed everything. And as followers of Christ, we know that to be true. For those who who don't know Christ in their lives, we know that that can be true as well. You see, It sounds so simple, but Jesus exists for everyone. Jesus died for you, for me, for your neighbor, for your coworker, for the person you sat behind in the drive-thru. Jesus exists for everyone. Someone once said that you have never locked eyes with someone that Jesus didn't die for. And we know that to be true. That Jesus is the friend that is there for us, the guide that is there for us, and the hope that is there for us in all ways. And at this church, at Kenwood Heights Christian Church, we believe a very important truth. We believe that a personal relationship with Jesus Christ can and will radically change our lives in incredible ways. We believe that as we come to know Jesus personally, And as we draw closer to him in each and every single area of our lives, he can do incredible things through us. For we know that there is nowhere better for us to be than in the incredible presence of our God. And so, yes, our worship has had to look a little different over these last couple of months, but our worship is still very real. Our our teaching approach and our weekly sermons have been a little bit different, but the truth and the power of God's word are still eternally strong. And while we as a church family have been unable to come together for in-person worship, isn't it so comforting to know that our God can use us as individuals to further strengthen the overall body of Christ? What a joy it is to know that nothing on this earth will ever come close to matching the beauty, the power, and the glory of our God. Isaiah said it far better than I ever could when he writes in Isaiah 26, You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. Trust in the Lord always, for the Lord God is the eternal rock. And we know that our God is our rock. And what a joy and what a hope it is that even in the midst of one of the greatest times of turnover that we will ever experience in our lives, what a hope it is that we have in our God. And through his son, Jesus, that he sent to this earth for us, we find peace, we find strength, we find a friend. We find a friend. Today, I'm so happy, so excited to be with you, so excited to share with you about what God is doing in my life, but also what I believe he's doing through us as individuals and us as a church as well. But before we dive into this further this morning, would you pray with me as we start our sermon off together today? Father God, I thank you for uh, this morning. God, I thank you that your kingdom never stops. God, I thank you that you're in control of all things. God, thank you that you work through us as individuals and you work through us as a church. God, may you use us to be a blessing unto those around us. God, may you fill us with your spirit today. May your words ring true. God, may everything that we say and do honor and glorify the beautiful name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, that we can be the church in all ways, every single day. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Well, as I said this morning, uh, I'm so excited just to be here with you and just to share with you about uh, what God is doing in my life, but also what I believe he's doing for us as individuals and us as a church as well. And I'm so excited today that we're going to look deeper into the heart of Jesus and to see more about who he is and what he thinks about us. And we're going to do that by looking through Scripture. And just real quick here this morning before we get going, uh, if I can give you just a quick encouragement that if you have your Bibles with you, uh, we're going to be using those a lot today. And so whether that is your your physical Bible or maybe it's your phone or tablet or whatever that might be, uh, we will be using those a lot today as as we dive into our message this morning. And for today, I am so excited to share with you that we are going to be kicking off a brand new sermon series that we are calling Jesus, the Compassionate 
friend. And over these next four weeks, leading up to Father's Day, we are going to camp out together in one particular chapter of the Gospels, and that is the book of Luke, chapter 8. And over these next four weeks, we are going to study in the book of Luke, chapter 8, together, and we are going to see for ourselves the type of compassionate friend that we find in the very nature of Jesus Christ. We will see together how, how Jesus is a, is a friend to the fearful, how Jesus is a friend to the addicted, how Jesus is a friend to the desperate, how Jesus shows us that as we draw ourselves closer to him and we submit ourselves to him each and every single day, he can do incredible things through us and through those around us as well. And even in the midst of feeling overwhelmed or overburdened or tired or stressed out or anxious, even when it feels as though as everything is kind of just spinning around to the point that we just can't seem to slow down, there's, well, there's still Jesus. Even when it feels like we are facing the struggles of life by ourselves and it just feels like we are at the point of no return, the point where we feel as though our sin is too large to forgive or the bridges in our lives are too far burned, even when it feels like we don't deserve grace or mercy or compassion, there's Jesus. He's a friend to the fearful. He's a friend to the addicted. He's a friend to the desperate. And today, as we get our series started together and we begin exploring Luke chapter 8 together, today I want to share with you about how Jesus is a friend to the lost. How Jesus is a friend to the lost because he came into this world to rescue us from our sin to restore us from our brokenness, and to renew us with the title that he has given to us, the title of son, the title of daughter. How Jesus is a friend to the lost because he calls us son and daughter. How Jesus is a friend to the lost because he can penetrate any areas of our life with his life-changing purposes, his life-changing value, and his life-changing love. Jesus is a friend to the lost because he has overcome the world. And we can find our hope and our direction through him. No matter where we've been, no matter who we are, no matter what we think about ourselves, we can rest assured that when all else seems lost, we can still find Jesus. Psalm 91 says this, it says, If you make the Lord your refuge, if you make the Most High your shelter, no evil will, over, will conquer you, no plague will come near your home, for he will order his angels to protect you wherever you go. And we know that in all things, no matter how many stresses we have in our lives, no matter how many frustrations, no matter how many worries, we know that in all things we can find a friend in Jesus. And so with that in mind, today we are going to dive in together to Luke chapter 8, starting in verse 4. And we're going to read a parable of Jesus' teaching that shows us that no matter who we are, no matter where we've been, no matter what we are doing, we can find compassion and we can find a friend in Him. And similar to the words of the father and the story of the prodigal son from Luke chapter 15, sometimes, sometimes we can be lost, but in Jesus, we can be found again because Jesus is a friend of the lost. You know, if we're honest with ourselves, uh, no matter how we spin it, being lost can be a, a frightening situation. Whether that is being physically lost, spiritually lost, emotionally, mentally, you name it. Being lost can be a, a very difficult spot to be in. And whenever we face that kind of situation, we all know we just need some help. Even in the smallest and simplest of ways. When I was a senior in college, like most college students do, I was trying to, to figure out what my next steps were going to be after I graduated. And after a period of time of not necessarily finding any full-time ministry opportunities that were going to work for me, um, I decided to, to take a step into something a little bit different. And so after graduation, I accepted a position to join the team of a great church in the city of Wabash, Indiana. And I joined their team as a paid student ministry intern. And so soon after graduation, I uh, loaded up my car and headed the four or so hours north to be a part of the community of Wabash, Indiana. And I'll tell you what, I was, I was really excited about it. Uh, this was definitely a, a new experience for me, uh, but I was excited to see what I would learn and what I would experience in Indiana. But on the other side of this, I'd be lying to you if I didn't tell you that I also had some real nerves about this as well. You see, for one, I had never been to Wabash, Indiana before. Uh, for two, I, I really didn't know anybody at the city at that time. And for three, this was all new to me. 
But despite those nerves, I was still excited for the opportunity to do this after school. Um, and so with that, I printed off my directions on paper because even back then, maps on our phones weren't nearly as useful as they are now. So I printed off my paper directions. I started up I-65 North and I started my time in Wabash. Now, just real quick as a side note to the story just about myself, uh, when it comes to certain areas of life, I am not always the biggest fan of surprises. I love a, a good surprise party or a surprise gift as much as anyone, but I will share with you that one area where I'm not the biggest fan of surprises is when I'm driving. Uh, I don't enjoy getting caught in bad weather. Uh, I don't like getting stuck on the side of the road, and I certainly do not like getting lost. I like to know where I'm going, uh, how I'm going to get there, and knowing that I'm going to get there safely. But sometimes, uh, when making a four-hour drive one way, that didn't always work out in my favor. I'll never forget um, that summer, I had been in Wabash for about a month or so, and on one particular weekend, I came home to Louisville to visit everyone just for a quick weekend visit. And so I came home for a brief weekend visit, and on Saturday evening here in Louisville, after a great visit seeing my loved ones, um, I loaded up my stuff in my car, and I set back on the road to get back to Indiana for church on the next day. And even though I was more comfortable with where I was, I still liked keeping those paper directions with me just to confirm that I was going the right way and staying on the right path after I got off of I-65. You know, I had to take some other roads that I wasn't as familiar with in order to get back into Wabash. But I'll never forget, as many of you have probably had a similar experience as I did on this night, I was on my way back on this Saturday night and I was making an easy drive, making good time. And the one thing happened to me that made my paper directions pretty useless. I came upon a sign that said, road closed, take alternate route. Now, for the most part today, we read that kind of sign and we immediately instruct our phones or our maps app, whatever we might use, and tell us to take us another way and we can get back on the road no problem. But at this time, on the type of phone that I had, I, I didn't really have an app like that. In fact, all I had were those pieces of paper. And I was trusting those pieces of paper to guide me back to where I needed to go. And as I laid my eyes on the sign that told me that the road that I needed was closed, it was in that moment that I realized that I had no idea where I was going. And to make matters worse, uh, the alternate route that I was sent on took me on some back roads that I had never seen before. And to add the final cherry on top, uh, due to being on these back roads, my cell phone service was pretty spotty at best. And so I was following these alternate route suggestions, not knowing where I was, hoping I was going the right way. And after only a few miles, I quickly realized I was lost. I quickly realized I didn't know where in the world I was, and I needed some help. If you've ever been in that kind of situation before, then you can attest that it is a helpless feeling. It is a helpless feeling when you are physically lost, and, and nothing looks familiar, nothing is sticking out, nothing is ringing a bell. And I remember very well the thought running through my head of, what in the world am I going to do? Well, thankfully, um, after driving on these back roads for about half an hour and having no clue where I actually was and having little to no phone service at all either, I found this tiny little gas station in the middle of nowhere, Indiana. Till this day, I don't even know what city or town I was in at that time. I was just in the middle of nowhere. And I went inside and I found this elderly gentleman working at the counter and he was the only one in the gas station. And I just went ahead and I laid it all out for him. I told him where I was trying to go. I told him I was lost and I asked him to give me any possible help that he might have. Fully expecting that he might tell me just to get out of his store or he might just try to point me back to a road I'd already been on. But I'll never forget this extremely friendly gentleman mapped out for me exactly where I was exactly which back roads I needed to take, and exactly how to get back where I needed to go. And sure enough, he was right. And within the next 30 or so minutes, I found a new ramp for where I needed to go, and I was no longer lost. That feeling of being lost, whether physically, mentally, emotionally, or even spiritually, can have drastic effects on us. Oftentimes when we're lost, we feel so alone. We feel as though nobody can help us, nobody can guide us, nobody can, can figure out what's inside our heads or what's inside our hearts. When we're lost, we, we need help. But we don't always know where to go to look for help or how to ask for it. 
But if you fall into that category today, If you fall into the category of feeling lost and sometimes thinking to yourself, you know what, I'll just figure this out on my own. I I don't want to bother anybody. I don't want to burden anybody. I don't want to trouble anybody. If that's you at all today, can I encourage you with something? Jesus exists for you. No matter how lost we might feel, there is a real hope that we can find in Jesus. Jesus exists for me, for you, For all of us. In Luke chapter 8, we read multiple stories with examples on how Jesus meets people who are hurting, how he meets people who are in trouble, how he meets people and he brings the ultimate light that can penetrate any darkness in our lives. Jesus is the compassionate presence who can guide us out of the darkness of pain, struggle, anxiety, worry, fear, and he can bring us into his marvelous light that can give us a new direction and a new hope. John chapter 8 verse 12 says this, says, I am the light of the world, and if you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness, because you will have the light that leads to life. John chapter 1 verse 5 says, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. And what a joy it is to know that truth. What a joy it is to know that Jesus Christ the Savior of the world, that Jesus Christ can meet us where we are and he can lead us into his rest, his hope, and his purpose. Jesus can meet us in our fears, in our worries, in our state of being lost, and he can rescue, restore, and renew us for his kingdom and his glory. What a hope that we have that Jesus can meet us in any and every area of our lives if we invite him in. He can restore our marriages. He can strengthen our families. He can bring healing for pain and hope for struggle. That in this world, our our personal pain and our personal struggle does not get to be victorious in our lives because our victory was decided when Jesus Christ went to the cross for me and for you. Jesus, the light of the world. Jesus, the compassionate friend. Jesus, the friend of the lost. You remember the words of the beautiful hymn, Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. And what a joy it is to know that in all things, we find our hope in him. Well, as I alluded to earlier, uh, today we are going to plant ourselves in the book of Luke chapter 8, and we're going to start in verse 4. And for today, I just want to study God's word with you, and we're going to read a, a parable commonly referred to as the parable of the sower. And for me personally, I think this is one of the most impactful parables that Jesus tells us in all the Gospels. You see, in this parable, Jesus makes an incredible point to remind people that even when we are lost in this life, especially from a spiritual standpoint, there is always a hope and always a way for us that we can find through Him. No matter who we are, who we've been, or what we do, our compassionate friend, Jesus, is still available to us. So today, if you got your Bibles with you, I want to encourage you to join me in Luke chapter 8, and we will spend the rest of our time there together today. And also today, I want to give you just a few quick encouragements as we go through this passage together as well. And as usual, if you'd like to, I encourage you to jot these down as we go along, and we study together the words of Jesus, the compassionate friend. Luke chapter 8, starting in verse 4, says this, One day Jesus told a story in the form of a parable to a large crowd that had gathered from many towns to hear him. A farmer went out to plant his seed, and as he scattered it across his field, some seed fell on a footpath where it was stepped on, and the birds ate it. Other seed fell among rocks. It began to grow, but the plant soon wilted and died for lack of moisture. Other seed fell among thorns that grew up with it and choked out the tender plants. Still, other seed fell on fertile soil. This seed grew and produced a crop that was a hundred times as much as it had been planted. When he said this, he called out, Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. You see, today, the first encouragement I want to give to you in regards to Jesus being a friend of the lost that we see from this passage is this. A deep connection to Jesus takes a strong commitment to Jesus. A deep connection to Jesus takes a strong commitment to Jesus. You know, in this passage, Jesus uses this parable uh, of a farmer sowing seeds to display the effect of the connection between man and God. 
And what's interesting about his choice of words for this parable is that we can probably assume that the group of people that Jesus is teaching to is probably filled with farmers. These are people who who know farming as their livelihood. These are people who know farming like we in the state of Kentucky know basketball or the Kentucky Derby. You know, this is not a, a new topic to them. And so Jesus is teaching his message and using this parable, but he's using a parable that will relate directly to the crowd who is listening to him. And as he's sharing this parable, he gives four different layers into his message and referring to the seeds that the sower is scattering. You know, for one, some of the seed falls on a footpath where the seed is is useless. And that seed would be stepped on and the birds would eat it and, and it wouldn't serve its purpose. For two, some of the seeds fall on the rocks. And that seed begins to grow just a little bit, but soon after a short run, that seed is not able to last and able to maintain. It had a quick run, but eventually it wasted away. For three, some of the seed falls among thorns. And while we'd hope that seed would grow and and become strong, alongside it would be thorns that would grow and do more harm than the good from the seed that was planted. But for four, for four, the seed falls on fertile soil. And that seed produces a crop that was a hundred times as much as it had been planted. That soil accepts the seed, nurtures the seed, and takes care of it so that the seed can produce exactly as the farmer intended. Now, I love the next part of this parable. You see, Jesus finishes telling this parable and, and, and his disciples, his closest followers, the Bible tells us the disciples, they just flat out ask Jesus and say, what did that parable mean? And Jesus says these words in Luke chapter 8, verse 11. And I really don't want you to miss this. Jesus says, this is the meaning of the parable. The seed is God's word. The seed is God's word. Pretty simple, right? The seed that is being tossed out, the seed that is meant to produce, the seed that is meant to develop into the crop that the farmer has designed it for, that seed is God's word. A deep connection to Jesus takes a strong commitment to Jesus. Jesus is showing us in his words that as people, no matter where we might be on that scale of one through four, whether we are on the footpath the rocks, the thorns, or the fertile soil, no matter which category we fall under, the opportunity is there for us to connect to him if we're willing to commit to him. We can come into his presence. We can experience a life change that only he can bring. We can be a people that in a way the world around us could never bring joy to us. We can go from being lost in this world to being found, but we do it through Jesus. Sometimes as human beings, we can we can have hardened hearts, but Jesus is a friend to those who are seeking help. Sometimes as human beings, we can have shallow hearts, but Jesus is a friend to those who want to go deeper. Sometimes as human beings, we can have crowded hearts, but Jesus is a friend to those who want peace. And when we are receptive to the seed, when we are fertile soil that accepts God's word into our hearts and chooses to live for him each and every single day, Our creator God can do imaginable, incredible, special things in our lives that can change everything for us. You see, in this parable, Jesus is giving us a prime example, and it starts with our commitment and our willingness to receive God's word in our hearts and to live our lives for him. Jesus is compassionate. Jesus is a friend of the lost. Back to our passage, starting in verse 11, Jesus says these words. He says, this is the meaning of the parable. The seed is God's word. The seed that fell on the footpath represent those who hear the message, only to have the devil come and take it away from the hearts and prevent them from believing and being saved. The seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they believe for a while, then they fall away when they face temptation. The seeds that fell among the thorns represent those who hear the message, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the cares and riches and pleasures of this life. And so they never grow into maturity. And the seeds that fell on the good soil represent honest, good-hearted people who hear God's word, cling to it, and patiently produce a huge harvest. You see, today, the last encouragement I want to give to you from this passage in Luke chapter 8 is this. And a connection with Jesus we find purpose. In a connection with Jesus, 
we find purpose. And that purpose is personal to each one of us. My relationship with Jesus is different than yours, and that's a good thing. Because when we know Jesus and we find our purpose in him, we find that we no longer have to be lost. Jesus is a friend to the lost because he came to rescue those in sin. Jesus is a friend to the lost because he brings value in areas that we struggle with. Jesus is a friend to the lost because his compassion and his love and his mercy far exceed anything else that we could receive. You know, speaking for myself, my God has blessed me with incredible blessings in my life, but two of the biggest blessings that I have that are far greater than anything I could ever imagine are my two kids. My son Noah is five years old, uh, and he just graduated from our preschool here at Kenwood Heights, and he's getting ready to start kindergarten in the fall, which just absolutely blows my mind. Uh, my daughter, Leela, is two years old, and she is growing every day like you wouldn't believe. Uh, and not this year, but next, Leela herself will be starting her own preschool journey as well. And if you're a parent watching with us today, or maybe you're a parental figure in the life of a loved one, uh, then you know as well as I do that there is a lot of truth in the lesson that my wife and I are currently learning. And it's a lesson that applies to all kids as well. And that is this, is that, man, they grow up fast. They grow up so fast. And certainly, when our kids grow up as quick as they do, as people who are invested into our kids, who love our kids, we all know this, that we want to soak up every possible moment with them that we possibly can. And that's a lesson that my wife and I are learning right now. We want to spend every second that we can investing into our kids, learning more about what they like, and building a strong relationship with them together and individually as well. You know, my son, my son is strong. Um, ever since he was a little boy, Noah and Daddy have wrestled together. Whether on the floor or on the bed, on the couch, wherever it might be, it has always been a thing for Noah and Daddy to come together and to wrestle together. And you know, when, when Noah was just two or three years old, it was fun because he would flail around and giggle and, and we'd goof around and that was considered wrestling. Well, today Noah is five. And while that may not seem like that big of a difference, I, I can tell you this. Wrestling has taken on a whole new meaning when it comes to wrestling with Noah. He dives, he does somersaults, he jumps on top of you with all of his weight and, and so much more. And I kid you not, I'll finish wrestling with Noah and more often than not, I'll have scratches on me that are fresh, I'll have bruises on me that are forming, and I'll have ice packs waiting for me in the kitchen. But I'll tell you this, I wouldn't trade it for one second. My daughter, my daughter is such a sweetheart of a little girl. And ever since Leela was born, Leela and Daddy would have conversations. I would lay on the floor next to her when she was a baby, and I would talk about anything with her. Anything that came to my mind, I would just start talking to her. And I knew full well she obviously couldn't respond to me as a baby. But even still, there was nothing sweeter than when she would coo or respond back to me in any way that she could. And when she was a baby, it was my favorite thing in the world to just lay down next to her, look in her eyes, and just talk to her. Well now, my daughter is two years old, and I no longer have to start the conversations. Leela is a chatterbox that can go all day long. And the sound of that sweet little girl talking about everything from kitties to dinosaurs to how much she doesn't like shoes, Leela and I can sit together for hours talking about everything under the sun. And I would not trade that for the world. And I am so thankful for the time that I get to spend with them individually, but also the time I get to spend with them together as well. And what I've seen and what I've experienced as a dad over these past five years has changed my life in ways that I never thought possible. Oftentimes I've found myself thinking, this is exactly what I wanted in my life. This is part of the purpose that God had laid out for me. And sure, my kids have hard days sometimes. And I have to get on them, I have to instruct them. And believe me, that as a dad, I've had far too many bad days myself. But all in all, every day, good or bad, tough or easy, big or small, there is not a second that I would trade with my kids. And the love that a father has for his children is an incredible love. And yet even still, I know that even though I love my children more than anything, that love pales in comparison to how deeply my God loves me and how much he loves you. You are a treasured child 
of the Most High God. No matter where life is for you at this moment, whether it has been severely impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, or it's stable, all things considered, I know this very childlike statement seems very simple, but I also know it to be 100% true. You have a friend in Jesus. Our purpose can be found in connecting with him every single day. And whether you are in the footpath, the rocks, or the thorns, there is always hope to find the fertile soil for each one of us. Whether we are lost, desperate, broken, or worried, there is always rest that is available to us in Jesus. And our purpose is found in Him. A deep connection to Jesus takes a strong commitment to Jesus. And in a connection with Jesus Christ, we find purpose. I'll wrap up with this. Um, Both of my kids love the Toy Story movie franchise. It is all they watch. It's all they want to be. They dress up for uh, Halloween as Toy Story characters, so on and so on. And I love seeing them both get so into Toy Story. And both of them also love the music from Toy Story as well. And one of their favorites is the main song from Toy Story 1 that you probably know as well, entitled, You've Got a Friend in Me. And, And every day, the words of that song resonate through my house on a loop as my kids listen to that while they play. But I love that song for one particular line at the end of the course. It says this. It says, if you've got troubles, I've got them too. There isn't anything I wouldn't do for you. We stick together and can see it through. Because you've got a friend in me. Yeah, you've got a friend in me. Jesus, the compassionate friend. Jesus, the friend of the lost. Jesus, the The light of the world is available to us. Would you pray with me? Father God, I thank you so much for this morning. I thank you, Father, just for the chance to to study your word. God, to read this passage out of Luke chapter 8, to to see the teaching of Jesus. Father, to know that there is hope for us every single day. No matter where we might be, Father, if we receive your word into our hearts, it can change things for us. God, thank you for the promise that you send to us in your son, Jesus. Thank you that we don't have to be lost because in Jesus we find a friend and we can be found. Thank you for the compassion and the mercy that is shown to us through your Son. Father, thank you for loving us the way that you do. We love you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Well, hey, we are so glad that you've joined us today uh, for our worship service. I want to encourage you to come back and join us next week and be on the lookout here in the next week as well for some more updates from our church about some things that we have coming up. As always, we encourage you to feel free to reach out to us for anything that we can do. And we hope that you have such a good week and we look forward to seeing you again here soon.